Helping the big guy make the holidays better, a major Army Reserve command jumps in to give Santa an assist. The perfect storm. Army Reserve soldiers, units, and commands answer the call for help when Hurricane Sandy hits the Northeast. Not your usual summer vacation. Army Reserve soldiers train hard to prove their metal in California, Arkansas, and Africa. These stories and more ahead on this edition of Army Reserve Today. And welcome to Army Reserve Today. I'm First Lieutenant Amy Crane. The Randy Oler Memorial Operation Toy Drop is the largest event combining paratroopers and kids in the world and the largest toy collection and donation program conducted in the Army Reserve. Hosted each year by the U.S. Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command Airborne, Operation Toy Drop brings paratroopers from around the world to Fort Bragg where they jump with Santa, bringing joy from above to children around the country. But it's more than a way to help children at Christmas, it's real world training for these airborne soldiers. Fort Bragg paratroopers had a Black Friday of their own. All right, come on in, two lines, two lines, one on each side. Over 3,000 of the finest lined up early in the morning with their helmet in one hand and a toy in another. Instead of buying, they were giving. Um, the first time I got here, it was like three years ago, I uh, got in line about uh, zero 04. It's for a good cause for the children, uh, make sure the you know, underprivileged get, uh, get a chance to experience Christmas. So also gives a chance to get out there and uh, you know, have fun and do a you know, good, good jump. Operation Toy Drop is an annual fundraising event where an airborne operation is combined with toy donations. Established by the late Staff Sergeant Randy Oler 15 years ago, Army Reserve soldiers of the U.S. Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command Airborne have continued the tradition every year with the organization of toy collecting and airborne training. 600 toys were collected in its first year, and in 2011, more than 22,000 toys were collected nationwide. It's a really good time because people always expect Soldiers do things for people, but they never really see like, the, the charitable side. So it's a good chance for everyone to see that it's not just about what we work, it's also, it's the person, it's not just the job. They're doing it because they're actually that type of person. Because no one has to be here. All these people are here because they chose to be. For most, it's not about earning foreign jump wings. I grew up as an underprivileged kid, so it's, it's kind of like an eye-opener for me for when I, when I was growing up. And while I wasn't able to get a, a toy, something like this would have been probably amazing for me. Paratroopers trained with jump masters from seven different countries, then jumped out of various military aircrafts and descended onto Sicily Drop Zone in front of hundreds of family and supporters for Operation Toy Drop. Well, I, I think this demonstrates the fact that, that an Army Reserve Command is putting this on for the Fort Bragg community. It demonstrates just what an operational reserve we are. We're no longer a strategic reserve. The Army can't go to war or, or conduct operations without us. And uh, well, we, are, we are truly a part of, of the Fort Bragg community here in the Airborne community. And the Army Reserve is, is truly a part of the operational Army. Jumps continued throughout the following week with over 3,000 donations from paratroopers. When the airborne operation ends, the delivery of the toys will continue. Reporting from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, I'm Sergeant First Class Andy Yoshimura. This year's event marks Toy Drop's 15th anniversary. Sergeant First Class Randy Oler, a former Special Forces and Ranger soldier, founded Toy Drop. Friends at Fort Bragg and other military installations supported his efforts. It was his idea to incorporate airborne operations, foreign military jump masters, and local charities to participate in the program. Oler died at age 43 in April 2004 after he collapsed aboard a C-130 aircraft during a daytime parachute operation, and he is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Operation Toy Drop is his legacy. Thousands of paratroopers have participated each year since 1998, providing tens of thousands of toys for children who wouldn't have a Merry Christmas otherwise. 
In late October, Hurricane Sandy devastated the Caribbean and then turned her fury northward toward the United States. The effects of the storm impacted 24 states, but hit hardest on the eastern seaboard through the American Northeast. Army Reserve soldiers, units, and commands were called upon to provide disaster relief support for the first time since the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act was signed into law earlier this year. It is a role that traditionally has belonged to the National Guard, and it is a mission the Operational Army Reserve will be executing regularly from now on. In the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, countless organizations stood up relief teams to support the victims of the storm. Many of them were sent up on very short notice. We didn't get the memo until Thursday saying, hey, we might leave on Friday, and, and as soon as Friday came around, they say, hey, bring up here ASAP, so we had to, you know, get our gear ready, ready to go, ready to rock and roll the next day. For the first time ever, members of the Army Reserve were mobilized to do their part. Three Reserve Quartermaster Detachments were sent up to Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst, New Jersey. They were equipped with 600 gallon per minute pumps and they were directed to Queens, New York, where they found some of the area's hardest hit by the storm. I live in North Carolina and we get hurricanes all the time, but you know, I've never seen nothing that bad. Trees fell over onto their homes, cars were crushed, people's decks fell off. Um, just everything people owned was like in front of their home, uh, pulled out, dragged out in garbage bags, like furniture, broken pictures and everything. It was just really sad, people's entire lives out in front of their house. Despite the devastation, they found New Yorkers who were struggling but determined to persevere. New York City is like the epicenter of resiliency. Uh, they're never beaten, whether it be natural disaster, terrorist attacks, uh, nothing divides them, it just makes them stronger and brings them together. As they tried to set up and start pumping out the floodwaters, they were greeted by a nor'easter that covered their initial efforts with snow. This only served to solidify their resolve. And we got six inches of snow on the ground, and us being from Florida, we weren't exactly, you know, equipped for that. <laughs> Some of the people in our unit, that was the first time they'd even seen snow, so. It was hard to work, but we saw the devastation under the snow, and so it, it really motivated us to, to get, get it done, get everything we needed to, and get started here. Despite the snow, they were able to clear out a school, a community center, and a number of other civic buildings in Rockaway Park and Long Beach. They worked in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers, the National Guard, and FEMA. The soldiers' efforts to pump water were vital to allowing their partner organizations to perform their respective support missions. They've all worked hard and they all feel like they're, they're being a part of a team to be able to help. And, and that's the most important thing. It makes me feel awesome. I mean, there's no better team than the Army Reserves right now. We're doing our best to help with these people and we'll do our best from here on out. Reservists have been deployed for humanitarian missions before, but they have never supported a domestic relief effort. This is the first year the National Defense Authorization Act has enabled reserve components to deploy within the United States. It provided for a very different and meaningful assignment. Most of us have deployed to other countries or had training or humanitarian missions in other countries and it's always an honor to be able to do those types of things, but to be able to help the people directly of our country is been a very humbling and very emotional and a very honorable experience for all of us. It's, it's just great to, to be out here, you know, in the rain, in the snow, in the cold, everything. I, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. After a few days, they worked their way down to Breezy Point, where their mission changed slightly to include cleanup as well as water removal. At this primarily residential area, they worked side by side with many of the local homeowners. It was great. I mean, they've been here. They came right away. They came with the pumps to pump out everything. You can see just on a state road, the main road was flooded for the longest time. And the army came in with the large pumps and pumped everything out. They're here with the tractors and the little bobcats, picking up all the garbage off the streets, getting to the main road. That's a big help for them down here. You know, people can't do it by themselves. The walks are so small, they can't get the garbage up here. But with the army coming and doing this, it's a great help. I mean, it's a, it's a morale booster also. Working with the residents led to mutual respect and appreciation. 
and the residents here have been great. I mean, they've been going out of their way to say thank you and how much they appreciate us being here and also providing us with food. They want to give us, you know, food and coffee, things like that, whatever that they can and any assistance that they can. But um, it's hard to take it when we know that they're out and about and they're struggling themselves. Really, we want to do what we can to give back to the people here and help them get their lives back together. After clearing houses by literally any means necessary, they packed things up, signed them back into the motor pool, and made their way back home. They returned home with incredible memories <laughs> and the admiration of the Americans they had helped. Helping us out is great. It's really nice. Touching. Very touching. Makes me proud. I just want to thank you guys. I want to thank everybody. The Red Cross, the Army, everybody that comes and helps because we need it, as you can see. I just want to say thank you very much for everything you do for us and for the country. Reporting for the United States Army Reserve Command and the 214th Mobile Public Affairs Detachment, I'm Specialist Christopher Toby. Army Reserve Today will be back in a few moments. I am Gary Sinise. As soldiers, you live by training, discipline, and standards, the three elements that are the very essence of military service. But there are always those soldiers who fall prey to recklessness and indiscipline. It might be you, or it might be your buddy, and it might happen after a night out with friends or on a Saturday afternoon with nothing but the open road in front of you. Know the signs, know what's right, do what's right. The Range and Weapon Safety Toolbox was developed to provide commanders and leaders resources necessary to establish and maintain effective range and weapon safety programs. You can get to the toolbox easily through the U.S. Army Combat Readiness Safety Center's website. The site hosts reference materials, links to other sites, and tools including the Defense Ammunition Center's Explosive Safety Toolbox and the Ground Risk Assessment Tool, which is designed to help soldiers identify, assess, and control hazards associated with specific missions or tasks. The toolbox isn't just for assigned weapons. There's plenty of reference material covering privately owned weapons as well. Remember to think weapon safety. Treat every weapon as if it's loaded. Handle every weapon with care. Identify the target before you fire. Never point your muzzle at anything you do not intend to shoot. Keep your weapon on safe and your finger off the trigger until you intend to fire. Remember, a weapon is an instrument of its operator. Shoot straight, stay safe. Army safe is Army strong. Welcome back. The Department of the Army held the 2012 Best Warrior Competitions at Fort Lee, Virginia in October. Representing the Army Reserve were Staff Sergeant Jeffrey Rios of the 84th Training Command and Specialist Michael Swan of the 335th Signal Command Theater. While the Army Reserve Soldiers and Non-Commissioned Officer of the Year didn't finish in the gold at Army level, they went head-to-head -head with the best soldiers in the Army in a grueling four-day series of events to prove they were two of America's best. Staff Sergeant Joy Doolin of the 335th Signal Command Theater Public Affairs Office has the story. Striving to prove they're the Army's best warrior. That's what 24 competitors showed up to do at Fort Lee, Virginia during the 12th annual Department of the Army Best Warrior Competition. But only one soldier and one non-commissioned officer, or NCO, can win the coveted title. Staff Sergeant Jeffrey Rios and Specialist Michael Swan represented the United States Army Reserve Command, or USARC, in the four-day competition, which included land navigation, a physical training test, casualty evaluation, and much more. What happened out here, man? Can you tell me? Do you remember? You know, you're, you're working on your ruck marches, you know, just building that endurance for weight on your back, uh, working your, with your equipment, learning it. Uh, the technical side of it, you're learning medical skills, uh, all your reports, stuff like that, uh, doing a lot of lane training. Rios and Swan were named USARC's best warriors in July and then got some intensive training to prepare for Fort Lee. Uh, we took the winner and the runner-up for the NCOs and the winner and the runner-up for the soldiers and we took them to Fort Dix, New Jersey specifically and we went through almost two months of training. They didn't have real bad weak areas, they just uh, needed we, we just pumped up on everything, specifically PT. We, we had a, a personal trainer come in, work with them, do stuff. Uh, did weapons once a week, did first aid every time. We did uh, mock boards constantly. We went through it all. All right, I'm gonna get you to lift up your foot a little bit. Master Sergeant Long says being a reserve soldier can be even more of a challenge in a competition like this. 
I, I know a stigma goes out to reservists, and they show that they're a soldier. If anything, in my personal opinion, it's harder to be a reservist than it is active duty, because uh, you got to do a civilian job and a military job, and you got to be proficient in both in this society. And they need to represent to show that we're soldiers, we're the same, and, and they're doing an excellent job of that. Though neither USARC warrior won the competition, both say all soldiers should strive for the challenge of best warrior. They should all give it a try because this tests how you, uh, what type of soldier you are and the knowledge and the training that you have received throughout your military career. It's a great experience because I get to uh, compete against the best warriors in the United States Army. Success becomes addictive. And when, when you get that taste of it, you want a little bit more. But if they just got out there and did it, they'd be all over it. They'd love it. Reporting for the Army Reserve, I'm Army Sergeant Joy Doolin, Fort Lee, Virginia. Exercises provide opportunities for Army Reserve soldiers, units, and commands for realistic training in unique places. During the combat support training exercise hosted at Fort Hunter Liggett, California this past summer, Warrior citizens got the chance to participate in medical evacuations using C-130 aircraft and civilian medevac helicopters. Specialist Benjamin Soler of the 222nd Broadcast Operations Detachment and Staff Sergeant Brian Raley of the 343rd Mobile Public Affairs Detachment have these reports. The sun sets over Fort Hunter Liggett, California as Chief Warrant Officer Ford, Jason Lonergan, delivers a briefing on the casualty evacuation training about to begin. The training mission centers on a C-130 cargo aircraft, a vital resource to American forces overseas. This particular event is uh, upload and download of patient litters, both litters and ambulatory patients. Uh, we're simulating moving patients from a, a cache to a, a rear uh, medical facility. This is stuff that happens on a daily basis in theater, and you don't want the soldier to see that for the first time uh, once they get boots on ground. Chief Lonergan belongs to the 91st Training Division and coordinates this exercise in cooperation with the California Air Guard's 130th RSQ Search and Rescue Unit, the 5502nd U.S. Army Hospital, and local firefighters. The 91st conducts many similar trainings, preparing our troops for conditions in the field. Reporting for the Army Reserve, I'm Specialist Benjamin Solaire, 222nd Broadcast Operations Detachment. Range Control, this is Rotorhead 6, requesting 9-line medevac. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Over. Break. Charles. In case of an emergency during Combat Support Exercise 91 on Fort Hunter Liggett, California, these soldiers would count on Mercy Air, a contracted civilian air medical service. Due to the real-world need of civilian support, training is essential because Mercy Air and soldiers would need to work together. The CSTX operation here, uh, where there, there may be real-life situations where you have a soldier injured, this is the aircraft that would provide medical assistance immediately. So to familiarize a, a body of soldiers from various units here, I think is very, very valuable. Civilians play a much larger role in modern operations. They perform many duties to keep soldiers in the fight. Well, I think it's good to have civilians work with military, especially when we're training on home front, because if you just have all military operating with military, then you know you only know the military side of it, where you got to take into account the civilian side. Training like this sets differences aside between military and civilian procedures with the ultimate goal of saving lives. Reporting for the Army Reserve, I'm Staff Sergeant Brian Rayleigh from the 343rd Mobile Public Affairs Detachment. Army Reserve today will be right back with a story of soldiers who could be rightly called road warriors. A warm fire feels great, but be safe around the home this winter. Only burn seasoned hardwoods. Use space heaters as directed and never leave one unattended. Have smoke detectors on each floor and test the batteries because safety awareness shouldn't be put on ice. You served your country on active duty and made a difference in the world. Now in the Army Reserve, you're ready for your next mission in life. 
If you want a college degree, the Army Reserve will provide financial help through the Montgomery GI Bill. You can build leadership skills in the Army Reserve to succeed in the business world. You can receive training for a variety of civilian careers. And reserve training is usually at a location near home, close to the people who matter most. Stay strong. Join the Army Reserve. For information, contact your career counselor or call 1-888-327-ARMY. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Welcome back. Army Reserve engineers paved the way for America's fighting force, and the 727th Engineer Detachment of Penn Yan, New York, one of only six asphalt paving units in the Army, says it's the best of the bunch. Smoothing the ride for thousands of soldiers who travel in and out of Fort Hunter Liggett was the 727th mission this summer. Specialist Mark O'Rear of the 326th Mobile Public Affairs Detachment brings us this report. There's only six asphalt units in the United States Army. They're all reserves, and we're one of them, and we're here. When you have a job to do, you should always get the best people to do it. Okay. That's why the 727th Engineer Detachment came all the way down from New York to Fort Hunter Liggett, California. We are the best because I know my guys, I know how hard they work, and I know how much they want to do it right. That kind of confidence comes from experience. Most of the engineers in the 727th have been doing this for a long time, and some also have a background in construction. Well, last year we paved um, in Fort McCoy for a month. We all trained on something in specific, so like this year I've been training other people on like a roller. Or... Learning the tricks of the trade makes for an easier training environment for newer soldiers. And what better way to learn than by doing it? Just you wait, dude. I'll do what I have to do. I'm a hands-on learner. I work better that way. When you know people want to say certain things to you, I mean, you listen, but it's better because someone can actually physically show you exactly what to do. It makes it easier to learn. By sharing their knowledge and understanding each other to get the mission done, it's easy to see why the 727 is a well-oiled machine. I got probably the best team in the world. Uh, they all work well together. They all work very hard together. So, uh, I can't be more proud. From Fort Hunter Liggett, California, I'm Specialist Mark O'Rear. Army Reserve engineers can do most any job, including building bridges, even under fire. Exercise River Assault 2012, held at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, put soldiers from the 412th Theater Engineer Command through their paces and tested their military skills under simulated combat conditions. Specialist Mark O'Rear of the 326 Mobile Public Affairs Detachment was there. The Master Bridge Commander is uh, going to be up here. Get that moved down to your location. Also. Roger. Yeah, get that down here too, please. The mission was a combined exercise with another bridge company to span 293 meters of the uh, Arkansas River. Roger, good copy. We provided half the bridge, the 739th provided the other half of the bridge, and we met in the middle. Get on, Get on. Open. Stretch it. Most of us have been working together for about three years now, so we're all in sync. We all know where each other are going to be. And then, like our deck hands, they've been with us too for about three years, so we're all really good to work together as a team. There's not much fighting or yelling out there. I'm just about ready for, to receive vehicles. Let me know when you're ready. River Assault is an opportunity for soldiers to learn. They're able to make mistakes, but it's not going to be catastrophic if, they, if it happens. Stop! Get out of here! So it's an environment where they can learn, take their time, and then build up to where they're at that run speed. Very few units have the opportunity to get on a river that fast. Very few units ever have an opportunity to actually use the ranges that are here. Just because you go over as a unit to Afghanistan doesn't mean you're going to be doing what your MOS taught you. You could be kicking down doors or blasting doors open and going on a stack and doing searches and stuff. So it gives them a chance to do that. And I like going out there and blowing a door or two. All right, that's good. That's good. Come on. She's going to get us ready just in case we ever get the point and have to do it over there. We got an idea how much people it takes to do to build it with. All the personnel we're all need for it. Most of the time we only get to work with each other a handful of times a year. To be able to then work together with another bridge company 
was amazing. We've got an amazing crew. My company is uh, under strength, but uh, we did what most companies could do, full strength. I am more than pleased to be serving with these soldiers. They're amazing. Yeah! The only company that could get me. River Assault 2012 had a lot of key players, and there were a lot of combat skills that came into focus, highlighting those warriors who bring the fight to the enemy and get the job, like building a bridge, done. But while he was there, Specialist Mark O'Rear discovered who the real heroes of this exercise were, and it's not who you think. Down by the, river. the unsung heroes of River Assault 2012 at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, aren't who you think they are. They're not divers, pilots, or even combat engineers. It's these guys, food service specialists. It sounded fun. Like the job description, when I read it, it just sounded like something that I could have fun with. And it has turned out to be a good time. <laughs> it's delicious. You're missing out. But it wasn't a good time at the start of River Assault. There was a problem with the first dining facility. The other dining facility was a lot smaller than this one. Um, it didn't accommodate as many soldiers to eat, and it didn't have as much equipment as this. That's a problem when you have more than 900 hungry soldiers. Any job in the military is going to hit snags, and you just got to adapt and overcome. We all came together. We knew that the mission at first was feeding the soldiers. So what, what we all jailed, and we came motivated, and we is what we had to do. Yes, you're doing a good job, Specialist. While it normally takes three days to shut down one kitchen, move, and prep another kitchen, the cooks did it in less than 24 hours. We worked nonstop until maybe 5 o'clock, and before we knew it, everything was done. It's all thanks to the cooks who have gone above and beyond to make it happen. I got some stars. I got some chefs. I got some pastry chefs. I got some people out here that should be E4, should be E5, E3, should be E4. All of them have done an excellent, marvelous job. A job so good, the cooks even got recognition from a different kind of star, a two-star general. It takes a lot of special care from cooks to make it taste good, make it taste better than just you know coming out of the can. So I'm pretty impressed. Thank you. Y'all have a good evening. After working with the other cooks, Sergeant Fouché has no regrets in his choice of coming to River Assault for his annual training. I could went to Wisconsin, but I chose Arkansas, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. From Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, I'm Specialist Mark O'Rear. The 396 Combat Support Hospital, an Army Reserve unit based in Vancouver, Washington, participated in Southern Accord 2012 in Botswana. The joint exercise gave Reserve and National Guard units the opportunity to test their skills with each other and this African nation's armed forces in an exotic location. When battlefield injuries occur, the Combat Support Hospital, or CASH, stands ready and waiting with life-saving support. The 396th Combat Support Hospital is built around speed and flexibility, attributes they tested during a mass casualty exercise on August 14th at Southern Accord 2012, a joint exercise between the U.S. and Botswana. The CASH cared for soldier injuries big and small, while other medical professionals graded their performance under pressure. So in the cache, you know, the Army is remarkably uh, well-trained. They are in a great position to take care of the wounded, and, and I've been really impressed. Although the environment can be chaotic at maximum capacity, the cache provides excellent care. Because most of the nurses and doctors do this on their civilian side, so when you're getting treated here, you are really getting some of the world's best medical care. Major General Patrick Donahue, commander of U.S. Army Africa, also toured the cache during the exercise and praised its performance. Sergeant Dan LaGrasso, Botswana. And that will do it for this episode of Army Reserve Today. For more information about the Army Reserve, check us out online at www.usar.army.mil, friend us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter at U.S. Army Reserve. From Fort Bragg, North Carolina and the U.S. Army Reserve Command, I'm First Lieutenant Amy Crane. Thanks for watching. <laughs>